Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh ayyul habba continue on in our study of bulugh al maram uh, the book of marriage we reached chapter 5 the division of visits to one wives and in this chapter this chapter talks about the division meaning the division of time and being just with one's wives as Islam uh, institutes the practice of polygamy and this is in accordance with the Emir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that it is permissible for male Muslim men, uh, Muslim men, to take more than one wife, with the condition that he must be just. So this chapter in Bulugh al Maram is all about the division of visits to one's wives, and as we mentioned, al Qasim, uh, al Qasim, meaning this division. Uh, is in reference pr primarily, predominantly, to the uh, to the time, to the time of splitting and dividing that a, a, a Muslim man spends with his wives if he has more than one wife. Uh, and as is well known as a principle that Islam. Uh, is about justice and that it is an obligation upon the Muslim man and everyone to be just uh, in Islam and this is in accordance with the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam as we'll get into more details especially with regards to the division of um, the division of one's time with, with regards to one who has more than one wife. In the first hadith in this chapter, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to divide visits to his wives equally and say, O oh Allah, this is my division concerning what I possess, so do not blame me concerning what you possess, and I do not. Reported by Al-Arba, Ibn Hibban and Al-Hakam graded it as Sahih, authentic. A tirmidhi held that the stronger view is that it is mursu, and meaning a having a missing link in the chain after a tabi'i. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, we have immense uh, benefits and from those benefits of this hadith is it shows us the importance of being just when regarding with regards to our time as the Prophet والسلام, had nine wives at once and he sallallahu alayhi wasallam was just in dividing his time and uh, along with that, it's very important, and as we learn from this hadith, the Prophet والسلام, supplicated. He supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying, O oh Allah, this is my division concerning what I possess. So do not blame me concerning what you possess and I do not. Meaning that those things which the Prophet والسلام, did not possess and which we do not possess has to do with uh, affairs of the heart as we mentioned that guidance the guidance uh, of tawfiq this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the guidance of tawfiq meaning for example that one accepts uh, Islam that this is the guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if you gave dawah to the person then that's another type of guidance that is called guidance al-irshad so the ultimate end result is from Allah whether that person accepts 
or not. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ilm that he knows this, subhana. Likewise, those affairs of the heart, so no matter how just you attempt to be and strive your, your best, that the affairs of the heart lay within the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lay within the hand of Ar-Rahman. And that means that you will find often is the case that a man, that if he has more than one wife, that he'll incline towards one or some of them more than others. And this is the matter of the heart. This does not mean that he's going to incline in his time. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ was mentioning. He said, oh Allah, this is my division concerning what I possess. What did the Prophet ﷺ possess? He possessed how he spent the risk from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was he just in spending? And how he, he, what he possessed of his time? Was he just with his time? And the answer is yes. Of course, he wasallam was the best of examples for us to follow. So, those things which we possess have to do with time and nafaka and our spending. But those things we do not possess, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't possess, is a matter of the heart, being inclined, having maybe more love or more passion or more desire for one uh, over the other. Uh, in this hadith, so it, it shows us that uh, that the, the, those affairs of the heart that we don't uh, control. And uh, from the point of benefit with regards to uh, gaining love, this is something that's very important for husbands to try to gain the love of their wives and wives trying to gain the love of their husbands and trying to increase that loves, love. And some of the ways in which uh, we learn from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that people increase that love and increase those bonds. One of the ways is by increasing the salams. As the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, uh, it mentioned that ifsha uh, salam bain al muslimin that this is a uh, way of increasing the love between the believers. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wallahi, لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمن ولا تؤمن حتى تحب أفلا أخبر أخبركم بشيء إذا فعلتموه تهببتم أفش السلام بينكم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim uh, in the book of Iman. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he swore by Allah, he said, Wallahi, la tudkhul jannah. You will not enter into jannah until you believe. And he said, and you will not believe until you love. Meaning you love. This is a part of a man loving one another, loving uh, the believers. And he said, should I not tell you about something which will cause you to have love between you? And he said, spread the salams between you. So, by coming into your household, that we should spread those salams, even to our partners. We take it for granted a lot of times, and we don't engage with our spouses as believers as well. And so it's very important that we spread those salams, and that is another way to spread the love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the law will place more love in your hearts between you, bi'idnillah. Uh, another way to spread and encourage the love is to give gifts. And the Prophet ﷺ said, to hadu, to habu. He said, uh, giving gifts will, will increase the love. That means if you give uh, people gifts, their general tabi'i, their nature, their natural inclination is that they're going to be moved by that gift. Even someone you don't know, that this is a way to break the ice. This is a way to meet someone. This is a way to... Uh, you know, when you and someone have just got to know one another, by giving them a gift, even if it's simple, the people reflect on that. And especially in cultures that are not gift oriented. And this is so the Prophet ﷺ said, to hadu, to habu. That if you give this, uh, this gift, gift giving causes love. So this is one of the ways 
that the husband can increase the love of his wife or wives is by giving them gifts. Likewise, the women can increase the love of their husband by giving them gifts or giving them something that they like, something special, even if it's not from wealth, but it's something treating them. Another uh, way in which, uh, from the Islamic perspective, that increases the love is to be good and kind and gracious towards people with wealth or uh, in a physical way or uh, other ways. These, all these things uh, and, and uh, increase the love between people. So this goes back even to the gift giving or through wealth, through spending or through, or through taking care of them physically. And especially between the spouses, this is something that has to be emphasized. And this is some benefits that Imam Ben Othaymin mentioned about the uh, how to increase the love. And this is very, very important, especially in our contemporary times, to for the wife, if she wants to increase her husband's love, it, uh, th physical means often is something that is very important for the husbands. Likewise, it is very important for the wife. So this is how we uh, can help uh, increase the love, increase the physical attraction. So taking care of one another physically and by being attractive to one another, taking care of one's body for the men, be healthy, be in shape. And this is just the nature of human beings to be attracted to someone who who is attracted to themselves and who takes care of themselves. Not the one who's out of shape and sickly uh, through their own uh, lack of attention to themselves or hygiene wise. So being clean, being attra attracting, making yourself attractive for your spouse is very important because that's a part of that physical, uh, those physical attributes to increase the love. Likewise for the women to take care of themselves physically, uh, to not let themselves, you know, as in the case of the men as well, to be sickly, to be, you know, sickly, sickness is out of our hands often. But if we are not eating right, if we're not exercising, if we're not taking care of ourselves, and hygiene and all these things, this can cause people to be away from one another and a lack of attraction. So what brings that marital bond and strengthens it and increases the love? One of the ways is to physically take care of yourself. And I have not heard of very many cases, and I think this is from just Khibra uh, Amaliyah, from, from um, experience, that you don't, you very rarely hear of people that are very conscious of their health and taking care of themselves, exercising, whether it be the woman or the man, that the partner is not attracted to them generally. Generally, you don't uh, hear of that being the case. You might hear of the opposite case, and people may wonder in their eyes and in, and, and, and in other ways because they no longer become attracted to their spouse. Well, law is to end. Another important fact is also that increases love is through increasing the visits to people. This is another way from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, with regards to this hadith, something else, before we even get into the, to the, to the benefits of the hadith itself, it's very important because this uh, stems from this love, as we mentioned, and that is uh, a jima'ah. And that is having uh, sexual relations with your your partner, with your with your husband or your wife, and this uh, is very important that the husband that has more than one wife strives his utmost to not be, you know, whatever's in the heart is one affair, as we mentioned. But as far as being just, as far as one having her night and the other having her night, and if he has three, then she, the third has her night, that he is uh, striving his best to be, uh, uh, to give her those physical rights, then this is very important. And the scholars differ over whether this is uh, an obligation to, to do this. Definitely, he does not have the right to be excessive with one and leave off the other. This is not uh, permissible. And those are masail that uh, the scholars, some of the scholars speak about in depth 
but this is not the time nor place to go into those issues in depth. So among the many benefits that we gain from this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, uh, one of the first benefits is the husn al-khulq of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the beautiful uh, manners of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam and this is from the perspective of or the point of how the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam gave such importance to dividing the time with the women and that and being just and that he وسلم, was the best of examples so this is from the good conduct the good manners of the Prophet وسلم, and when we say we follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that we should strive our, our utmost to follow that beloved example and be good with our wives uh, as a Prophet وسلم, was the best of us to his wives another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us that the what is meant by uh, dividing one's time and the way in which one treats his wives is justice this is what is meant is that these things should be done are, are built upon justice. They're built upon being just. Because the one who's oppressive, the one who is tyrannical, <coughs> will, uh, for one, in this dunya, will probably receive uh, similar treatment or will have, uh, you know, will be detested in this dunya. So what about the hereafter? So it's not even just about looking out for the treatment that is reciprocated to you but it in and of itself seeking this justice to follow the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and being just with one's wives is what's matloob shar'in it is what is uh, desired as a sharia uh, from the sharia it desires that it obligates us with that meaning it's an obligation upon us to be just with our wives <clears throat> Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that those things that we are not in control over, we're not responsible for. So, for example, here in this hadith, that the Prophet وسلم, supplicated, he said, O oh Allah, this is my division. So, this means that this was his effort. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, given the, his, doing the best that he can, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, O oh Allah, this is my division concerning what I possess. So those things which he, pos he possesses that were within his means and his limits, then he fulfilled that duty. And he put that forth, those deeds, he prayed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, invoked his Lord Subhanahu, and put that forth before his Lord say please don't hold me responsible and don't hold me responsible for those things in which I don't have control over and those things which uh, uh, he didn't have control over and that is affairs of the heart so this hadith illustrates for us that as believers that we do our best in whatever the case may be whether it be trying to be just between our, our, our spouses our wives whether it be any acts of worship that we do, we do our best and put our 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 our, our most uh, put as much effort as possible uh, to fulfill those deeds and do our best. And that which is out of our hands, we're not responsible for. Allah is not going to punish you for that which you didn't have the ability to fulfill, that which you are unable to fulfill. And in this case, it has to do with the matters of the heart. Of, uh, of, of having equal love and equal desire for the wives. Those are things you don't control. They're things outside of your realm of your sphere of control. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us 
that uh, love itself is something that we a person does not have the uh, ability to control themselves. You can do things, as we mentioned, that can increase the love between you. But ultimately, that is an affair of the heart that sometimes even if someone beautifies themselves completely, you know, the man has done everything, he's clean and he's trying to be handsome for his spouse, but that may not be what moves her heart. And likewise, they may not be what moves his heart. So that uh, people are not in control of love. And this we learn from this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the du'a, فِيمَا فِيمَا تَمْلِكُ وَلَا أَمْلِكُ He said, for those things uh, which I, uh, for those things uh, that I have no control over and that you have control over. And so, and, and, and those of, of those affairs is the affairs of the heart and that love. Those are some of the benefits amongst the many benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who has two wives, and inclines to one of them will come on the day of resurrection with a side of his body inclining, reported by Ahmed and Al Arba. Its chain of narrators is Sahih or authentic. So this hadith illustrates for us again the point that the other hadith made, and that is justice. So that is one of the most important kawaid that you can, uh, principles that you can learn and practice from these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu regarding division of one's time and one's wealth and spending with, with one's wives. When a person has more than one wife, that they must do everything to be just. And this hadith illustrates for us and makes bayan that the one who is uh, it shows the akuba or the punishment or, uh, you know, the result in the hereafter, uh, the threat of punishment for the one who is not just with his wives, the one who inclines toward, towards one of his wives over the other. This inclination, again, going back to the first hadith and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that this, you know, we don't have control over what's in the heart. So this is not talking about the love in the heart, but this is talking about your outward action of what, how your, your treatment. Are you treating one with disdain and the other one with immense love and affection? Are you hurtful to one and you're so kind and gentle and caring for another? Are you spending on one and the other one you don't provide for her? Are you... Uh, uh, giving your time equally between them? Or are you giving one her due right in time or even more than that and the other one you're taking from her? So this is very important and this has to do with the the issue of justice and the and as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone who has two wives and inclines to one of them will come on the day of resurrection with the side of his body inclining. So this shows a jaza min jens al amal that the reward or the result of something is relative to the uh, to the action. So, for example, the one in this dunya who was unjust and leaned and inclined towards one wife, he will physically lean and, and in in the hereafter he will receive a punishment relative and similar to that which he, the right that he took in the dunya. From the benefits of this hadith, is this hadith is a stern warning of being unjust with the wives and leaning and inclining towards one wife over the other. And we mentioned the ways in which a person can do that. Another uh, benefit of this hadith, this hadith also teaches us that it is an obligation to be just between wives uh, if one has more than one wife, even in, uh, whether it's two, three, four, that the principle is the same 
you must be just and that there's a stern punishment for the one who leaves off justice and and uh, who leaves off justice and doesn't fill the rights the rights of his wives uh, also something very important is that uh, from the principles of the Sharia is that if there's a threat or a punishment on leaving something that uh, is evidence that that thing which a person might leave off is an obligation uh, because the threat of punishment only comes to the, with those things uh, you know which are muharram which doing it is is uh, is going to be haram so there's no threat of punishment for example if someone leaves if someone does something makruh if, if something is disliked in the sharia from the different uh, ahkams in the sharia and someone leaves that something uh, someone does that thing which is makruh it means that it's disliked but there's no evidence to support that it's muharram and that there's a punishment tied to it. It's just, it's uh, not preferred as an action. Okay, it's an uh, action which is not preferable. However, justice, it's an obligation to have justice. And leaving justice, there's a threat of punishment. So in this hadith, it mentions not being just, but meaning, it mentions being unjust and that there's a threat of punishment with being unjust therefore by being just then you are doing the obligation you're doing the opposite and i hope that's clear so that's where that qaida that principle uh that principle comes from another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also affirms for us the bath yom qiyamah and that's why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith he said ja'a yom qiyamah Meaning that the person will come on the day of judgment. What day is that? The day of judgment. And the day of so what does this hadith do? It affirms for us that there is a day of judgment. There's a day we'll be held accountable for everything that we did in this de in this life. Will Allah understand? May Allah help us to rectify our deeds. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith, as we mentioned, al jaza min jins al amal, that a part of of uh, the person uh, uh, leaning and inclining towards one wife, which is an act, action of injustice, and the part of the punishment of that, the reward for that, so to speak, but better to term it as a punishment, will be in the hereafter that they will also be inclining, that they will not be resurrected straight. And we don't know the reality of that but we just know that the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said uh that uh, and inclined to one of them will come on the day of judgment with a side of his body inclining so that person on the day of judgment this is a part of a punishment that's not a good sign that's not something that is 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 um uh, that we want we want to come to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of forms and shape having done good not with crookedness because we did evil so this shows us, illustrates for us that part al jazab min jins al amal that part of the reward of an action is that there will be something in like kind in the hereafter. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that uh, this hadith also shows us that the lack of justice between. Uh, between one's wives is one of the major sins. That this is not a light sin because whenever we have a punishment tied to an action in the Sharia, either a punishment that is, takes place in this life or a punishment in the hereafter that is delil or evidence to support that that action with the threat of punishment is a major sin. It's not a minor sin. And in fact, we want to be fearful of all sins, but those things which are specifically mentioned in the Shara, in the, in the Book of Allah, or in the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that illustrate that, that there's a punishment tied to that, uh, then that lets us know 
that that action is one of the major uh, sins. And may Allah protect us from our many, many sins. In the 907th hadith, narrated Anas radiallahu ta'an, it's from the sunnah that when a man who has a wife marries a virgin, he should spend with her seven nights, and thereafter divide the time between them equally. And if he marries a formerly married woman, he should spend with her three nights, and thereafter divide the time between his wives equally uh, agreed upon, and the wording is al-Bukhari's. <clears throat> In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's in the chapter of the division to one's wives because it gives us and illustrates for us what the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with regarding to dividing the time between one's wives, especially if one has more than one wife. And this hadith clarifies for us uh, at the time of marriage, how this division should be done. Uh, this hadith is also is a narration of a Sahabi of Anas and when we have a narration of a Sahabi and a statement such as the statement that was used in this hadith, such as Min Sunnah from the Sunnah, or some similar. Uh, statement similar to this, or can a Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, used to do such and such, that this hadith has the uh, the hukum or the ruling of being something which is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, being attributable to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a hukum or rafa meaning that it, it goes back to the Prophet ﷺ because of the uh, trustworthiness of the Sahaba ajma'in. And so in this hadith, it wasn't a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, but rather, Anas said, min as sunnah from the sunnah, letting us know that this is from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This was uh, how the Prophet ﷺ made the qism or made the division with his wives. So he said, uh, it's from the sunnah that when a man who has a wife marries a virgin, virgin, he should spend with her seven nights and, there, and thereafter divide the time between them equally. So letting us know that from the sunnah, from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, is that when a man takes another wife and if that wife is a virgin, that from the sunnah, it is to stay with her for seven nights, to give her seven nights. Uh, and this is from the justice of the Prophet Sallallahu and part of the wisdom of that is because uh, the uh, a virgin who has never been with uh, a man before, uh, this is a new experience for her and coming into a polygamous marriage as well, that this is a way of easing her into the marital bond and giving her some time in this new uh, life to spend some time with her husband. And so this is from the ways in which the Prophet uh, made that easy. And it shows the mercy of the Prophet Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the hars or the, uh, the desire of the companions to learn the sunnah of the Prophet in order to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and practice that sunnah and spread that sunnah. So this is Anas ibn Malik Anas uh, teaching uh, because he is passing on. They were preserving the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, salam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows from its apparent meaning uh, illustrates a type of difference between the uh, the virgin and the woman who has been married before that this uh, that the Sharia gives some distinction because that's why it's from the Sunnah of who 
the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu to make this distinction in the hukum as far as when a man uh, marries a virgin, then this is the hukum or the ruling pertaining to that is that he spends seven nights with the new uh, wife. So it shows that there's a distinction in the ahkam. Uh, another bit of this hadith is that the characteristics uh, of someone or something in the Sharia has an effect upon rulings. And this is related to what we just said in that because of the, uh, we see that the Sharia or the Prophet ﷺ made a distinction between the woman who has been previously married and the virgin that this is a Sharia ruling and that the Sharia does recognize this when there is uh, some positive effect from that distinction because the Sharia only comes with good. Uh, another benefit of this hadith that and when there is this type of distinguishment in the Sharia, that of course this is from justice and this is not from oppression because the Prophet ﷺ came as a mercy for mankind and was not one, was not oppressive. And this comes from Allah, your Lord, Rabbil Alameen. So there is a, a hikmah from this and there is wisdom in whichever way uh, it means that the Sharia makes distinction between individuals or between the description of items or goods. In the next hadith, narrated Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, when the Prophet sallallahu married her, he stayed with her for three nights and said, you are not being humbled in my estimation. If you wish, I shall stay with you for seven nights. And if I stay with you for seven nights, I shall do the same with my other wives, reported by Muslim. In this hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, the hadith of Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, we see that, uh, which is an extension of the uh, the other hadith, in, in that, an, an extension in educating us uh, regarding the hukum or the ruling with regards to dealing with the virgin and the thayb or the uh, woman who had pre previously been married. And in this hadith, one of the benefits of this hadith is it illustrates that uh, if a man, that the asl from the sunnah, as we learned from the last hadith, is that when a man marries uh, a virgin, that he stays with her seven nights, okay, if he if he has another wife. And that if he is marrying a woman who has been previous married, married previously married, then from the sunnah is to, to stay with her for three nights. And so this hadith uh, illustrates that also that it's uh, the permissibility and from the sunnah is to khayraha, is to give her a choice to actually make a uh, to ask her uh, so to give her the option that when you marry a woman who is not a virgin that from her right is that you stay with her for three nights but it, uh, with regards to if you are previously married and if uh, and, and giving her the choice to uh, either choose to have that hukum which is already, uh, to, to do that right which is already, to exercise her right which is given to her according to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu or give her the chance to have the, what the option of the uh, virgin has. However, the distinguishment between these two ahadith and this right and the right of the virgin is that if the woman who has been previously married if she's given this right, she, you ask her and you say, uh, would, if you would like for me to stay with you for seven nights, then uh, she has that choice. If she says yes, then the person 
the man would stay with her for seven nights and he would transfer, this right would be given to his other wife. If he has another wife, she would have the seven nights. So it is just as giving her a fadila, a benefit here, but this is not the same as in the instance of the uh, the woman, uh, the, the virgin, whose right is those seven nights. And I hope that's clear. Meaning a virgin, if you began, which we find from the first hadith, the hadith of Anas, uh, that the virgin is given those seven nights, then after that, as Anas mentioned, then the qasam begins after those seven nights. After those seven nights, then the next wife gets her one night. And then the next night is the virgin's night. Or, the you know, the, the, the virgin's night. And then on, so on and so forth. You start the regular divisions. In the case of the marrying a thayyib, which we learned from this hadith, the hadith of Um Salama, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that if the, if she chooses to have these seven nights, then the qism would begin after that seventh night that the husband would stay with the first wife and he would have her one day and then uh, one night and then one night back at the other house. So the qism would start immediately after that and that uh, would be the result of her having the choice of choosing that uh, situation. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us the husn al-khulq of the Prophet wasallam, the excellent manners of the Messenger of Allah wasallam, in that he uh, asked Um Salama if she, uh, you know, he gave her this choice. He asked her from his good and righteous conduct, he asked her if she would choose, uh, if she, she would like to to have those seven nights, which it aslan was not her haq, is the haq of the virgin. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked her, uh, and that shows that his, uh, that this was his, uh, uh, this was his, from his way, his sunnah is to have excellent manners. And in regards to that, we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, the Prophet said, There isn't a thing which weighs heavier on the scales of a mu'min, of the believer, than good manners. And verily, Allah hates wicked and sinful speech. Letting us know the importance of manners and the importance of following the sunnah of the Prophet who had the best of manners and the best of inter a way of interacting with people. Another benefit of this hadith Another benefit of this hadith is uh, th that this hadith also illustrates for us that the wife of course has now become family that when a man uh, takes a, a, a wife, of course, now they're in the marital bond. So now that becomes his family. She has rights and, uh, rights and responsibilities towards him, and he has rights and responsibilities towards her. And so they, are, and of course, it's not just a series of, series of rights and responsibilities of just give and take in that manner, but they are family, that this is a marital bond. Those are some of the main benefits. Uh, another uh, benefit that the scholars mention with regards to this hadith is this hadith also uh, illustrates that that uh, and, and actually I was mistaken in, in accordance to the uh, explanation that if the woman, the thayyib, the woman who is uh, uh, who is not uh, a virgin, she is married, and you give her the choice, 
and she chooses to take that seven days, then the Qism not only starts after, but the Qism or the division would be seven days for the for the husband's other wives. So for example, if a man has two wives, he's married this new wife, to make it clear, he's married this new wife who is not a virgin. And then he gives her the choice. He says to her that, uh, uh, it, w it, would you like for me to stay seven nights with you? And if so, then, you know, and explains to her how that, how that would work. So if, he's, if she chooses, yes, I want you to stay seven nights with me, then that means with his other wife, he would start the qism after he would start the division after those seven nights with the new with the first wife, and he would stay with her for seven days. So it wouldn't be just starting the qism, but it would start the uh, uh, it would start it, it would be it would start the qism, and it would and he would start he would have uh, seven days with his other wife, because uh, originally in its origin that wasn't her her right, her initial right, is that it would be three nights and then they would begin the division. But since she's chosen to have something which is sort of an increase on her rights, so to speak, then this would be, then he would come back to her after, uh, after spending those seven nights with her, then it would be another seven nights with the other wife. If he has three wives, so he already had two wives, and he takes a third wife, and she's a thane. She is a, uh, a, 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 not, a not a virgin. And he gives her the choice, and she chooses those seven nights. Then the seven nights, the man will have the seven nights with her. After the seventh night, he will have seven nights with uh, one of his other wives, who is in accordance with the, however the, uh, organiz the they've organized their time. And then after that, he would have seven nights with his second wife that he, he had, because he already had two wives. So that would be 14 nights away from the first, the new wife. Okay. Then after those 14 nights, he would spend the next night, he would begin the kissum after that. So he'd spend one night with her and then how, however they've organized their time. If they've organized it night by night like that, or if they have some other arrangements, many people have various arrangements. But in accordance to the Sunnah, in accordance to uh, just these two hadith, this is what becomes apparent according to the explanation of the ulama. So this illustrates for us the importance of the division uh, of of wives that those divisions in Islam are very important the qasm that these are the rights of the women when one has more than one wife that he must be equal and just with the time especially and of course in the spending the nafaka and just to recap on this hadith in the uh, as a part of it to emphasize it's important uh, We'll read the hadith again because it, it's very important for us to ponder on the alfad, the statements that Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, narrated Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her, he stayed with her for three nights and said, you are not being humbled in my estimation. If you wish, I shall stay with you for seven nights. And if I stay with you for seven nights, I shall do the same with my other wives, reported by Muslim. So, as we mentioned, we already mentioned the, the benefits of this hadith, but one last point I want to make from this hadith is that the Prophet, والسلام, again, he gave her the choice with regards to the hadith, uh, with regards to the qism or the division. And likewise, he وسلم, said, You are not being humbled in my estimation. To, uh, if you wish, I shall stay with you for seven nights, and if I stay with you for seven nights, I shall do the same with my other wife. It shows the justice of the Prophet ﷺ, and it shows that he was not uh, that he was not belittling 
uh, Um Salama. And there are other stories with regards to this hadith, uh, and some report that it was a relation that he was giving her a choice also to uh, to be to be divorced, but that she, radiallahu ta'ala anha, out of her love to be the wife of the Prophet sallallahu was willing to uh, give up. Uh, to give up her, her, you know, to give her time, and that this was not a belittling of her, but rather this was, uh, and, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ, what illustrates for us, aside from we know the Prophet ﷺ would never be condescending, but what also illustrates, the Prophet ﷺ said, you are not being humbled in my estimation. Let her know, because for some, for the Arabs, the tribalism, perhaps amongst her tribe, or her family, that this would be considered belittling. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, comforted her with a statement, you are not being humbled in my estimation, to meaning that you are not any less than any of my other wives, that you have value and you are beloved to me. Uh, in the next hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Soda uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha, daughter of Zama gave away her day to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allotted a share to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha of her day and sodas uh, mutafakun alayhi agreed upon. In this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, in this hadith, there are uh, immense uh, benefits in this hadith. And from those uh, uh, benefits, one of the first benefits is this hadith illustrates the permissibility uh, for a woman to give up her her right, her 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 haq, uh, as far as her night of of, of division, and this was done because the Prophet uh, you know. Uh, Soda radiallahu ta'ala anha, she agreed to this with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if that had been something impermissible or prohibited, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would never have accepted such a, uh, a practice. So it shows that it's permissible. This is in the right, in the hand of the woman, that she has a right to her rights and she has to right, she has the right to give up her right if she wishes, her right for nafaqa to be maintained. If she's a wealthy woman and she has no need for wealth, she can give that uh, that right up if that's what she chooses. Or if she has the right uh, for her night, she can give that night or several of her nights to a co-wife if that's what she chooses to do. And that's her right to give, not anyone's right to take from her. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates because uh, illustrates the uh, that it's the uh, the exemption uh, of for example uh, in the hadith the the prophet والسلام, said. Uh, or that uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that Soda uh, gave away her day to Aisha. And the the word that was used in the Arabic, Wahhabit, uh, Wahhabit Yomaha, that he, uh, she gave her her day away. And this Wahhabah is not in the since as it's used as a terminology in other aspects of the Sharia as far as gift giving. But rather here, she exempted, and it shows that it's permissible to exempt oneself, uh, but rather she exempted herself from the, the, the what is an, uh, an obligatory division, meaning that she gave her right away 
to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates the uh, the the full the intellectual the great intellectual capacity of Soda radiallahu ta'ala anha in that she was willing to give up her right in order to be still amongst the believing women because uh, as I mentioned prior to this and in fact it, it's in regard to this hadith not the hadith the last hadith uh, that uh, some of the narrations Ill, uh, show and the story behind this is that she uh, believed she was going to be divorced by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so this is one of the reasons why she gave this right up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best however uh, this shows her aql and her intellectual capacity uh, the, the the excellent uh, intellectual capacity that she had anha, in that she was willing to give up even her right in order to remain with the Prophet وسلم, and be from the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen who we uh, show and, and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, on behalf of and, and say may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him uh, so she chose to remain under the uh, you know being being the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that if a woman for example if any of the wives radiallahu ta'ala anhum hunna if any of them had given up that right or had been divorced by the Prophet وسلم, then they would not be considered of the Ummahat al Mu'minin. So it was through this uh, marital bond that they were the mothers of the believers. And this gave them their honorable status and the stat status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a status with the believers and, and love of the believers. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that it's permissible for a woman to give her right away to a specific uh, individual, meaning to give to another wife. For example, if uh, a man has more than one, uh, more than two wives, if he has three wives, for example, and one of the wives says, "I'm giving my day to such and such, to so and so," and so she is giving up her right so that a particular other wife can have that right, that that's permissible. So that shows that it's permissible to give the right to a specific wife and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Anything I said that was correct, anything I said that was incorrect was for myself and the shaitan.